All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get into our Father's Word? We're going to do another special today. We're going to call it Feed My Sheep. It's real good for us sometimes to go back into the very basics. But if you listen to the teacher of teachers, and that is to say Jesus Christ, many times there's great depth in the simplicity of his teaching because he was very gifted at taking that that was complicated and simplifying it where we could all understand. So, one of his instructions, and how did he relate people to sheep? Well, you remember from the beginning, sheep have been basically symbolic of our people. You could go all the way back to the time that Abel was the terror of sheep and Cain was supposed to be a tiller of the soil. However, God knew that Cain was not of Adam. Therefore, he failed in his efforts of producing an offering to God. But probably the first time that our people were related to as sheep was by David. And if you want to make a note of it, it would be 1 Chronicles chapter 21, about verse 17, where he had numbered the children of Israel. There's one thing that God is always very ticky about, and he is ticky about this. David numbered the troops to know how much strength he had as a good general would do. But God does not expect us to consider numbers of men to protect ourselves but Almighty God himself. Therefore, David was in the doghouse, and God was going to punish the people. And David would say in that 17th verse of the 21st chapter of 1 Chronicles, Blame me, I am the one that ordered the numbering. They are only sheep. And that would probably be the first time that we're really related to a sheep. But then following that, many times, and of course it would be through David that that lineage would come. Uh, we're going to do about two lectures in this subject. I, I, think, I hope you find it rewarding. Considering sheep, we would almost have to go back to the time that he became the greatest gift, the greatest blessing that man has ever received, when he was the lamb slain. And we find that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. With a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go to it. And it reads, verse 1, Who hath, re who hath believed our report? Question. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Is it to you, beloved? The, the arm, of course, is the strength and the power. Is it revealed to you? Do you see God's power? Do you understand him? Do you understand how he protects you? Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form uh, nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he was the, he was the full sum, if you would. Um, very intelligent, eyes that... Um, uh, was in fact the eyes of God. Very impressive. This was, of course, the Lamb of God. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And it is true, the night he was crucified, or on that day that he was crucified, the entire flock left him, except for the women who stood by and were on a hill nearby, that were with him. And, um, but the, the multitudes that followed him for healing and for food dissipated, not there, for Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We let him do it for us. He that was perfect, 
It shows you that mankind with its rumor mongering and so forth can build a case up against a perfect individual. There was only one, and this was him. Five. But he was wounded, that's to say he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins, not his. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In other words, it would seem that whatever our intentions, however good they might be, we always seem to fall short. That's the flesh. But he paid that price whereby that we are healed from that trip to the abyss with his forgiveness, his love, and the fact that he being that perfect sacrifice to appease our Heavenly Father. Six, all we like sheep, and there it is, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, God allows him to pay the price for every sin committed in the world except that unforgivable sin that will be committed and can be committed by God's election after, I repeat, after the spurious Messiah appears on this earth. Not until. But... I will familiarize you before we finish this lecture with how it is that sheep go astray. You're supposed to know. You're supposed to understand because if you look at the actual animal, then you can understand what he's saying concerning the people. Sheep without a shepherd scatter. They have no leader. And that's why they... they a lamb is probably, aside from a human baby, one of the most helpless babes that ever could be. Sheep themselves have no great protection as other animals do. A lion or a, a canine, they have fangs where they can rip and tear and bite that that would rend them. Not the sheep. It is their shepherd that must protect them, for they are all but defenseless aside from the lamb. Verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought, brought as a lamb to the slaughter. They're again referring to him of this member of the animal kingdom, the lamb. And as a sheep, before her shares is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Have you ever seen someone shearing sheep? They trust their shepherd enough, or those that tend them. They're not going to cry. They trust them enough to know that, or, and to have enough faith to believe that what they're doing is right. I know there are exceptions to every rule, be that as it may. Verse 8, but I must continue. As Christ was delivered up before Pontius Pilate, Pilate would say, Say something, don't you realize they're going to take your life? Say something to defend yourself. He opened not his mouth at all, and Pilate wanted to release him. You see, prophecy was being fulfilled because had Pilate released him, then you and I would not have that wonderful thing called forgiveness on repentance that is now in place. Uh, it would have gone away from God's plan. Eight, he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? That's to say those that follow him, that seed line, that tender plant. For he was cut off out of the land of the living, crucified. For transgressions of my people was he stricken, not his own. That's, that's the difference between the Savior and ourselves. You must understand that. 
If there was any one entity that should have ever passed through heaven on his own merit, it would have been Jesus Christ. But no, he chose to pay it for us because he was the only lamb without blemish. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He was crucified between two malefactors, criminals. And he was placed in the tomb of a rich man because of Joseph of Arimathea, Mary's uncle. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He did not curse anyone when they were cursing him. He did not cry out. Verse 18. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, put, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. And he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In other words, God's plan happens exactly as it is. Now that sounds very simple, does it not? But listen carefully as we continue here. The lamb was slain and paid the price to bring salvation to the world. But listen, verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. In other words, the price is paid. Your sins were stamped paid in full when you repent by this one. God was satisfied. But by what? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. But you see that word, his knowledge. He was the greatest teacher that ever walked the earth that could take the flight of a sparrow and turn it into a beautiful message of teaching that everyone could understand, utilizing it in an analogy of God's love for us, that God himself would become flesh and would pay the price for his own children because he wants their love. He would never ask, the Heavenly Father would never ask one of us to do something that he would not have done himself. Many people forget the knowledge that was passed on through the simplicity of Christ's teachings. And it is necessary to complete that chapter 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And we be some of those transgressors. But even as he would go among those that were sick, that meaning sinful wives, the piety would say, Do you sit with sinners, publicans? When he paid the price for all and did not complain one iota. Again, understanding the life form and style of that animal, the lamb, the sheep, and the ram, we better understand how that he gave his life for us, even as a ram will lay down his life for his flock. But it was not, as some might think, a sign of weakness, but great strength. Because at any moment, he could have picked up his life the same as he laid it down. At any moment, he could have destroyed the enemy with a word. And he did not. Why? Because he loved you. Who would pay for your sins if he hadn't? He's the only perfect. All right. Now, let's go on if we made it to Ezekiel. Let's stay in the Old Testament here a little bit. Ezekiel chapter 34, as we go into the 
life of the land and why God would utilize this. The title that I call this lecture was Feed My Sheep. There are many people that would like to feed the sheep of God, the lambs of God, that are not really quite qualified, that have devious reasons and motives for teaching. God takes a very dim view of this. It does not please him at all. He calls them false shepherds. The word pasture, in which is the land, the acreage that the flock grazes upon, from that word pasture, we have the word today in the church, pastor. In other words, the one responsible for the pasture or feeding the sheep. Any man, woman, or child that intends to serve God and thinks more of themselves and their wants and needs than he does the flock. You see, that's the mark of a shepherd. David, as the shepherd, would attack a lion single-handed, would kill a bear. For the people of Israel? No, for his sheep. You see, the mark of a shepherd is for the flock. In when the flock happens to be God's own children and somebody abuses them, teaches for money or for some other reason, God is very unhappy. Chapter 34 in the book of Ezekiel, verse 6. Let's see some of his emotions concerning that. Verse 6 reads, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. When the ten tribes were taken north uh, over the Caucasus Mountains, were later called Caucasians, that migrated over Europe, that settled there, those sheep scattered throughout the world, it is for this reason that we do documentaries checking the languages, alphabet of the peoples, and the things that they wrote and chiseled in stone hundreds of years ago, the migrations of those sheep to identify them, to tell them who they are, to be a shepherd to those that are scattered through the nations. That's what he's talking about here, verse 7. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. That's what a shepherd is supposed to be, not the words of men. But the words of the Lord, 8, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. They were only interested in self, raising money for myself. You know, the harling is one that cares only for self, and certainly when the wolf comes, and I relate this back to the sheep, they run. Not as David, who attacked the lion head on for the sake of the sheep, but most run when they are not a true shepherd. Hey, you can't con God. God knows what's in your mind and heart. Verse 9, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is your message. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I, God speaking, I will deliver my flock from their mouth, their mouth of lies and one verse Charlie's and 
people that uh, do not teach the word of God to the flock whereby they even know who they are, that they may not be meat for them. It is really sad that some flocks lead, the, some shepherds of this generation would lead the entire flock to the edge of the abyss and shove them over and be leading them on to receive the first furious Messiah. Why? They do not read God's Word. They listen to the traditions of churchism that is passed down. I love the churches, but there is some of their teachings that is an abomination. Verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, and listen up, that's two times for emphasis, will both search my sheep and seek them out. God does have shepherds, praise God for them, that do search out the sheep, that do uh, teach them, that do feed them, that is to say. And I guarantee you, any time you hear some pastor say, Well, I just can't build my congregation, he is not feeding them. Sheep are very loyal to eat, and any time you feed, they're at the trough. If you don't feed, naturally they're going to look, they're going to stick their head through the fence somewhere or try to. They don't want to starve. Verse twelve: As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, and he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep, as he called you, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. The day of the heathen, the day of the Gentile. That's why many feel and know that there is more to God's word than they've been taught and have known it since they were a child. It's natural. It is the call of God to get you back into a deeper truth of his word. And verse 13, And I will bring them out from the people, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land. Ultimately it will happen. And feed them upon the mountains of Israel. Wherever the house of Israel is, so is Israel. Wherever the house of Judah is, so is Judah. By the, Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places, of the country. How fascinating that our Father loves his children as the shepherd does his sheep. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel, that's to say the nations where they were scattered to, and shall there and of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold. And in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. Have you ever wondered how that the Christian nations are always so blessed? Hmm? I mean, just, just look around you today. Take inventory. He knows where they are. To him they are not lost. It would be for this reason that Jesus, when he would first send the... Uh, Apostle Valley would say, Go back to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? But he where Judah was. It was because he had not paid the price on the cross that salvation was open to all the nations, which is to say Gentiles. After the crucifixion it was, and they were sent out to the whole world. But God blesses his people wherever they are. It is no accident that this great nation, America, that Canada, that this hemisphere is so blessed. It is the safe fold and the best pasture. Fifteen, I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. Have you ever wondered concerning wars and, and uh, destruction? How many of them have happened in America until we did it to ourselves? Think about it. Verse 16, I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, I repeat, driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. 
that I will destroy. Listen to me, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. That is to say, the shepherds, false shepherds. I will feed them with judgment. Boy, have they got a day coming. Verse 17. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle. That's to say between sheep and goats. Between the rams and the he-goats. You know the prophecy concerning the he-goat from the book of Daniel. 18, seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. In other words, you false shepherds, you take the word of God that is supposed to feed the flock, and you plow into the drinking. Have you ever seen someone plow into a drinking pond and let their little hooves hit the muddy bottom and stir it up until it is filthy? And the innocent lamb that is supposed to be fed cannot drink. And God is saying, all you do, let me translate it for you. He said, some of you so-called shepherds stir up and confuse and mix the word of God up in such a way that all you do is muddy it for the people, and you're going to pay for it. You know, I am glad that he cooks the fat out of the fat the very first thing, because many of them need to be rendered down considerably. Oh, for the day of rendering. God is not pleased. And judgment starts with teachers, preachers, and pastors. Make you uncomfortable? Well, it helps you keep your act together, and still we fall short. But never, never be caught short in teaching the Word of God by substituting the words of men that's where the rendering comes forth from. Yes, he judges. Now, next verse, please. And we go on then to verse uh, 19. And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet. They got to. That's all that's left. And they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. How can they understand the word of God with such confusion put into it by the, the inaptness uh, of those that are supposed to be able to handle the Scriptures. 20. Therefore thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle, that's the false shepherds, and between the lean cattle, that's to say the scrawny sheep. That means... I'm not going to take it out, as David would have, have asked him back in First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 17. Don't take it out on the cattle. Take it out on me. God's saying, I'm not going to take it out on the scrawny, starving sheep that haven't been fed. I'm going to get you. 21. Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns, till ye have scattered them abroad. You would not take the food that I had for the trough, the living word, and hold them. 22. Therefore will I save my flock. That's the message of salvation. And that is God's plan. But it disturbs him when his sheep are not fed. And there is only one food that they will digest, and that is the manna from the word of God, which is to say the truth of that helps you in the wilderness. And they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle. I'll separate out the fat ones from the scrawny ones, those that have been abused. Oh, would I hate to be in their shoes. Those that are supposed to be pastors teaching the Word of God, and they'll take one little verse and then blow hot air for an hour. 
And if they've got a golf game, maybe only 20 minutes or something else to do. And draw a salary for it. It's a disgrace to anyone that would be dedicated to the wholesome foliage that God has placed before us that they would rob the people in that manner. There's only one letter that is important on this earth. The salvation into the eternity, that is to say, the letter that God has written us that shepherds are supposed to teach. Verse 23, And I will set up one shepherd over them. That's the good shepherd, my friend. And he shall feed them. Even my servant David, through his that gene, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Don't ever forget that simple 23rd Psalm, which follows the 22nd, that would cover the crucifixion of this one having paid the price for us. It is not a psalm of death, the 23rd Psalm, but a psalm of life. He leadeth me by the still waters. That means the, the spiritually dead people, the valley of death. They move, they work, they punch their time cards, they even go to their little houses to study, but they never quite get fed. But he prepareth a table for me in the face of my enemies. This table, the word of God. 24, and the Lord will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, meaning there, de facto, in person, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And when he speaks, it comes to pass. You know, the sheep, when they are scattered, they scatter indeed. They feel hopeless. They feel alone. And certainly are aware of the dangers of the world, for they have not that shepherd. But all you have to do is when your shepherd calls, and he does, hear him. And he will protect you in those places as long as you use common sense and learn to protect yourself. Verse 25. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and the sheep in the, and, and sleep, rather, in the woods. You know, the poor sheep today... We have allowed the elements to cause it to be very unsafe to even go into the woods or the streets because of, of the wild beast, and that's all they are. They're heathen beasts, and they should be exterminated, and they will be exterminated unless they change their hearts and minds because God is going to get rid of them once and for all. If you think that's a racial statement, you're very mistaken because all children are God's children. But if you choose that path, it's you that ask for it and boy, are you going to get it. It is not good that we allow heathen to run loose in a civilized world to this point. And thank God something's going to be done about it. God being in control shall ultimately erase them from the face of the earth and put them in the abyss and blot them from the record. They shall never be again. But as a shepherd, it is the obligation and duty with love to reach out to all and try to save as many as you can. And there's only one way you can save someone, and that's let them speak the truth concerning what they do. I feel sorry. Do you think that, let's say that you see an elderly lady walking down a street at night. She has her purse gripped. That's the, all the money she has for the month. And some punk, no good punk, comes up and rips it from her. You think you're getting away with something, my boy? Uh-uh. Boy, are you going to get it. Do you think you're worth living? No. God will destroy you. Where is the love in your heart that you should help her? 
That's all she has for the month, and all you want is a quick pop in the arm, so you should die. You're not fit to walk this earth with a civilized people. I don't care what color you are. White, brown, whatever. If you will take advantage of an old lady, you're not a human being. You're a beast that God will rid the earth of. Strong, yes, but that's the way I can help you, is to face the realism of what you're doing. You see, that old lady could have been your mother. That child that someone molested. You don't deserve to live, and you're not, because God is going to destroy you. Because, you see, that little lady may not have been your mother, but it was one of God's lambs. It's already written in the book, and you've had it until you change. You better fall on your knees and beg forgiveness and start taking care of people rather than abusing them. Because this world is going to be made into a safe place. God's going to do it. But there are many of us shepherds that you touch one of my sheep and you're not long for this world. Verse 26. And I mean, you can talk about me all you want to. Hey, I'm a tough old bird. I can handle it. I'm an old ram that's been there a few times. Shed a little blood for this nation in the hills of Korea. I mean, I can handle it. But don't touch the sheep of my father. Verse 26. And I will make them... I will make them... And the places around about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down to his season. There shall be showers of blessings. There can be for you today. And you punks, you can have those same blessings if you change. You see, he loves you. We just hate what you're doing. And sooner or later, Maybe a lot sooner you're going to get it. Verse 27. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe. It's coming. They shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke, got rid of the false preachers and the punks, and delivered them out of the hand of those that served themselves of them. Boy, are they going to get it. And what a blessing it will be. 28. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. Neither shall the beast of the land devour them. But they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. Not three times you're out. First time, that's it. God doesn't play games. 29, and I will raise up for them a plant of renown. And that's the Messiah. I am that I am. And they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen punks anymore. Boy, it will be so good to have the earth ridded of them. Criminals are criminals, whether they're teenagers or old men. We'll be rid of them. 30. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. I wonder if God's real. Stick around, friend. You'll find out. And, they, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. 31. Are you listening? And ye, my flock... The flock of my pasture are men, not sheep, men. And I am your God, saith the Lord God. Act like a man. I don't care if you're 16. Act like a man, not a criminal, not a punk. You're a man. A man, if he sires a child, loves the mother, and takes care of that child. It's his seed. But an animal 
has no feelings whatsoever for a child. Well, uh, you see, it's like this. Uh, welfare takes care of... No, God's already written your name in the book, son. You're not a father. A father is, is a being, a human being, who cares about his offspring. It's time that love and responsibility comes into being, or you're going to go hungry, friends. God said if you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't take care of your responsibilities, you'll be destroyed. It's up to you. Every individual chooses their outcome of their life for themselves. And this is such a beautiful world we live in. Opportunities for everyone. But so many false shepherds cause people to be turned away from the Word of God, though it is strong, and though it is firm, it's the real thing. And He will protect you and bless you, even now. And the, the sky is the limit. You can be successful. You can be somebody. But do it for yourself. Don't expect to make your way off the poor and the lame because God is keeping score. And boy, I pity you. You may be the dandy cock of the walk, or think you are. A rude a con, man. I could rip people off. I could jerk purses away from elderly ladies. Well, isn't that something to brag about? God's keeping score, and boy, are you going to get it. Show dignity and respect and love for your fellow man. We have a good world. Stop muddying up the water. That goes for shepherds and those that make it not safe for civilized human beings to walk our streets. We've about had it with it. Okay? You got it? God has passed the mark of having had it with it. And it is the day of our Father. He has warned us. May we take heed. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He loves you. He cares. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're the one that snatched that purse. If you repent, He will take you as a child. And with your cunning stupidity, you could probably use a little of that intelligence to becoming a decent human being put work it to your advancement whereby you'd be somebody instead of a crumb. It can happen. God loves his children. It's a wonderful world. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. All right, bless your heart. You listen in a moment, won't you please? All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to continue in our study, Feed My Sheep. The sheep, I'll just real quickly recap. You'll remember probably in First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 17, David first mentions uh, the, the children of God as sheep. Now, why does God relate, and even Christ himself, as we're going to learn in, the, in St. John chapter 10, refer to the children as sheep? Then, in understanding how sheep, how you care for them, the lambs, gives you an uh, in-depth feeling towards God's emotion to his children, because sheep must depend on their shepherd. As I stated in the last lecture, they don't have fangs as... The canine family is dogs or lions. They have a shepherd to protect them. And that shepherd, in our case, happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, also, the shepherd would take his sheep out in the daytime from the sheepfold. The sheepfold was usually, we'll call it a lot, with a lean-to type shed or perhaps even a barn for someone that was well-established. And each night, the sheep were taken into, it's where the term passed under the rod comes from. In other words, he counted each 
lamb, each sheep, as they went into the sheepfold for the night to see that they were all accounted for. Thus we have the saying today, to pass under the rod. Now, and most shepherds, when they had a minimal flock, as they did at that time, would name their sheep, literally. There was a, there was a love between that shepherd and his animals that you would have to, it would be difficult for someone to understand had they never been around uh, a shepherd and his lambs. In other words, a shepherd, in, as in David's case, he killed a lion for his sheep. He slew a bear for his sheep. A shepherd will lay his life down for his sheep to take care of them, for they are helpless. But also, if that shepherd calls the name of that sheep, that sheep will not if, maybe, but will learn to that shepherd and, and with joy, just really with recognition, the sheep know their shepherd's voice. But let a stranger come by and try to call that sheep by name. Giving the name, the sheep will depart, for they only obey the voice of their master, their shepherd. So that's what this parable we're going to cover today in the 10th chapter of St. John has to do with. I mean, that's the way it is in actual life. Therefore, we, we relate those emotions between ourselves and Jesus Christ, he being our shepherd. And you're never alone. He always has that rod, that shepherd's staff, to protect you wherever you are, though you cannot see him necessarily. It's there, okay? Now, chap let's, let's get right into it. Chapter 10 of St. John, verse 1, and it reads, Verily, that's to say, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, this is this place of night keeping, but, cli but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, Many times these rock or stone walls that were built as the sheepfold, thorns would be placed on the top whereby if a wolf came and tried to climb over that wall, then there would be thorns there awaiting. Okay, so verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. In other words, the shepherd and, and the porter. Well, let's go one more verse, verse 3. To him the porter openeth, that's to say the doorkeeper openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, emphasize, hear his voice, and he calleth, I repeat, calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them. He does not take that shepherd's staff or rod and beat them and drive them. He calls and they follow. You ever heard him call? You know, some of you, since you were a child, you have known there was more to God's Word. And you have that inner desire to search, to seek, to find out. Many times that's he calling you, calling you by name, if you happen to be one of his election. He has something for you to do. He wants you to become a part of his fold that he will utilize, especially in this generation. He knows their voice, they know his voice, and there is a relationship of love set forth there that is very difficult for man to understand if he has never experienced it. Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, when he puts them out from the sheepfold into the pasture, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him. I emphasize again, follow him. He doesn't drive, for they know his voice. Do you know the true voice? Or, you know, you're going to have shepherds that are going to come along occasionally, and they're going to say, the Lord says that we're all going to do this, that, or the other, and that you are to bow down, and that you are to in servitude and really though you're no good you're going to do as I say the Lord didn't say that 
So when a false shepherd comes along, have an ear. It's not your master's voice. His voice is bringing forth traditions of man. That means danger to one of the true fold of God. When you hear a false shepherd's call, run the other way. You don't have to run, just go the other way, because he's a fake and a fraud. The way you can tell a shepherd's voice is whether or not it is the voice of your true shepherd, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the living word, all of it. It's this word you will hear, not the traditions of men, of don't do this and do do that and you'll do it my way. No, you do it God's way, your shepherd's way. You hear his voice uh, and you follow him. Verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This, this word know, in a sense, means that you, once you feel the voice of the true shepherd intuitively, that means from deep within you know when you're hearing the truth, and you know when it's the voice of a stranger that it's a tradition from men and not from God. And you depart from them, and don't you ever apologize for it. For all strangers are not true to the flock and will only share you down to where there's nothing left, rip you off, and there you stand. Verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them. It's an excellent parable. But they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am, there's that sacred name, I am the door of the sheep. In other words, I am the way and the door into that sheepfold. You must go through the Lord. Verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. In other words, they knew something was wrong. They were never fed from that pasture. That false shepherd always uh, misleading, trying to, uh, as a thief and a robber, begging perhaps, or something of that nature, but never feeding them. A servant is worthy of his hire. There's nothing wrong with that, and though I choose to do otherwise. But there's nothing wrong with a servant that is worthy of his hire. But he must be a true shepherd before he can do that, to care for the sheep, to take care of them. And in this case, to care for people, children of God, and give them the truth and lead them, regardless of what men might say but to lead them in the way of the Lord. He is that door, and there is no other way. Okay, verse 9. I am the door, but by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's the message. He shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. In other words, if you enter by the door of the Savior then the Holy Spirit touches your mind. And you have the freedom, I want you to understand that, the freedom to go in and out. You're a free soul. You are released from bondage. You can go in and out on your own, and you will find good pasture, because he becomes your shepherd. And through the Holy Spirit, he touches your mind. And that truth, comes into your mind and you know the voice uh, of your shepherd. You know and can absorb the living word, which is the food that the lambs of God feast upon. Verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Why? They're led by the destroyer. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you have it abundantly? Do you know something? 
life is really good, you may not have the things that people of the world might consider good, but when you have his touch, <coughs> excuse me, in your life, then you know and you understand the beauty of his love as he leads you and feeds you. And you know it is not something that is a passing thing as this world age is, but that it is for an eternity, and there is an abundance of it. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep, and he would soon he would be crucified. The greatest gift ever given to the children of God, inasmuch as he was perfect and we are not. And within that perfection, at repentance, our sins are blotted out. Verse 12. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf cunning and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. What would have happened the day that David was out in the field, and a lion approaches just lip licking his chops for a nice tender lamb? Had David been a hireling, that is to say somebody in it just for the money and could care less about the people, then he would not have stood. I just say that to emphasize the mark of a good shepherd and in contrast to a hireling that will run or shake and usually is not all that much of a man anyway. A hireling that only cares for himself is usually a noodle, a wet noodle, no backbone. That's why that a man, woman, or child of God needs no uh, labels to be identified. You just know that you know. Okay. The verse 13. Is that the next verse? Okay. The next verse being 13. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Just doesn't care. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known of mine. God's elect especially know their shepherd. There need be no question. 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so knoweth I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 16. And other sheep have a, I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd, king of kings and lord of all lords. Uh, this means that in a, after the crucifixion, he paid the price for Gentiles over the entire world, both sheep of other pastures, that all children of God, that his salvation would be there for whomever would. And what a joy and a blessing it is that our Heavenly Father would lead. You know, it just came to my mind, I just finished translating some ogham found in Kentucky that was put there in about eight or 900 A.D., in that very clause that his arms are open to whomever will was in part of that Ogham statement. I'll be sharing that with you in 30 days or so. How fascinating that God sent out shepherds long, long ago, even to this great nation. Verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He had no doubt that when he was crucified, when he paid the price for you, for this man, then he knew that he could take his life right back up, that he would resurrect from that tomb. 18. 
No man taketh it from me. You think they crucified him? He allowed it. They didn't take it. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. This is important. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. In other words, the Father had given him the plan of salvation, and that plan of salvation would come to pass as it is written in this letter that he has written to you, that you can understand through the simple, basic life of a shepherd and his flock. How precious it is to see that love, that standing between death and life for that that he is in charge of. That's what Christ is to you. Do you think for a moment that when you become a part of his flock that he isn't watching? He watches over you. He cares. He loves. And he feeds. Verse 19. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews, the Judas, that's to say the citizens of Judea, for these sayings. I didn't quite understand that. 20. And many of them said, He hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Why do you want to listen to him? 21. Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? In other words, his credentials were that when the blind man came to him, he touched him. And the blind man could see. That's pretty good credentials, my friend. He touched the sick. He touched those that were paralyzed, and they walked. How are you going to argue with that? That's what they're saying. How could a man with a devil do things like that? 22. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. This is that feast of, of uh, reconciling all things of the, verse 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, you must remember from the book of Ezra, the servants of Solomon, that there were many Nethanim among them, okay? Just remember, verse 24. And, Jesus, and 24. Then came the Jews... He owed us, that's of the tribe of Judah, but also many of the Kenites, the bad figs, that claim to be of our brother Judah. They, they came around about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt, Christian? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Oh, he already had. He had said, I am. That, that is the Hebrew sacred name. All right, verse 25. Watch the simplicity in which he answers and absorb the food that he places in your pasture for your consumption. Jesus answered, answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The touching of the man paralyzed that walked, the touching of the blind that they observed, saw. 26, but you believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You see, there are other sheep, and those particular sheep have their own shepherd, and he is the devil himself, Satan's own sheep, the Kenites. They're not about to hear your voice if you happen to be a spokesman for the true shepherd. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is what he's saying. It's quite obvious here, friends, that you're not my sheep. All right? 28. And I've given to them eternal life. What a gift. And they shall never perish. That means they're not going to that burning pit of hell, the abyss, and be brought it out. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now think about that a moment. Do not read over it. No man can
can pluck them from my hand. Why? He is your shepherd. He watches over you. And nobody, I mean nobody, can take you away from him. An impossibility. Verse 30. Now you talk about a real shepherd. That David set the example. 30. I and my father... I'm sorry, verse tw were we doing 29 or 30? We're doing 29. My father which gave them me is greater than all. He's stronger than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Why? Our father is the strongest. He does whatever he chooses. He created all things. I might say, what do you have to be worried about? The answer? Nothing as long as you use your head, as long as you use common sense as long as you follow the shepherd, the true shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 30, I and my Father are one, and then you see the Godhead in its entirety. What a beautiful picture, what an analogy of seeing that gentle flock and in, in its humility. Nothing is, again I say, more helpless or than a lamb. A lamb or that entire flock must, I repeat, must depend on their shepherd. And when you are placed out into this world with its wolves, with its thieves, with its fake shepherds, then you must be very aware and maintain and hold to that true shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. His word, which is the food. Never forget what the pasture consists of, as it is written in the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 8. The famine or starvation of the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. That's the pasture. He provides it abundantly when you take the time to absorb and know that your shepherd protects you wherever you are, again, as long as you use common sense. Let's turn ahead, if we may, to the 21st chapter. This is what we've worked up to in this great book of St. John. Let's see, I'm going to pick it up in, in the... We'll pick up 21, 15. Go to the 15th verse. Read with me and listen carefully. Christ giving final instructions to Peter. So when they had dined, Jesus uh, said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Me. Peter, do you love me more than the rest of the apostles do, the disciples? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. Now, I must insist that you note that the word lambs is used here, not sheep. What are lambs? Lambs are those that have tender ears that are new in the Word. Peter was a, an accomplished student of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why should he take his time with a beginner? I mean, the reason I say that is because many of you, when you come into knowledge, you grow impatient if a teacher takes the time to teach the young. The, the reason we do this, the reason we teach on more than one level, is so that the lambs are cared for as well as the advanced student. And it is simply to the hearer's ears, if you are a good teacher in feeding this word, that it comes out in at least two different levels. Uh, depth. That's why many times when you re-listen, you see something you did not see the first time. Because it is taught on multiple levels. That's the way Christ taught. That's the way Paul taught. But he's asking here, don't overlook the lambs. And what, what does the lamb need? 
milk. The very simplest of things, milk. Never overlook that. And never be impatient, regardless of... You may turn, uh, if you study hard enough to be one of the greatest scholars that ever lived, it's possible, or just a great scholar, period. And great scholars have a tendency of deep thought. And if you're not real careful, you can lose your patience with the milk, thinking anyone should know that. Well, if they don't, they don't. Because but by the grace of God, there you go. Because there was a time that you had to digest the milk. So, again, never forget, feed the lambs. And then, verse 16, he saith to him again, the second time. Any time the Lord Jesus Christ does something in multiples, it's for emphasis. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of, son of Jonas, that's to say the dove, the Holy Spirit, lovest thou me? He said to him, Well, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. And here you come to the adult animal. Feed them. What an interesting thing that he would do this two times for emphasis. So what becomes the number one charge of the shepherd, or that is to say the teacher, or in this case, to put it more direct, the pastor. That's the person in charge of the pasture, the food. Two times for emphasis, feed. In other words, to feed, you must utilize God's Word, not church systems, not church quarterlies, not church annuals, unless they are very attuned and the scholar that have prepared them is a believer in Jesus Christ and prepared them in such a way. Why? Look for some other work when you have the work of Almighty God taught in such a simple way that little children could understand because he taught in parables. That means not making it complicated, but making it a great deal more simple whereby other people could understand. But, on the other hand, Inasmuch as Christ seemingly to some taught in such a simple way, you not let that fool you into thinking that the deeper meat is not there as well. For then you overlook that that he would have you see. Now, listen again. That's twice. Once the land, then the sheep. 17. He said unto him the third time, three times now for emphasis, absolute. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? I mentioned Peter, and as much as he had denied him thrice on the a cross, is beginning to be a little nervous here. Why? But he asked him three times. Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Question. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. So, that's what you have. What is a Christian supposed to do? Well, how am I supposed to make my church grow? Well, the first day that Peter fed the sheep, 3,000 joined. What was he feeding? Read it in Acts chapter 2. The very story of the crucifixion. The very story, if you would, of the, the plan of salvation. The truth from God's Word. He quoted from the book of um, Joel. In, in that day. He told why the crucifixion was and where it was written. He spoke of the shepherd David in that chapter. 
and the church grew. Never complain, dear pastor, about your church isn't growing. If it isn't, you're not feeding. Because I don't care where you are, if you feed, it won't happen presto magic. But if you feed in that same place, it is not long until the hungry, starving sheep learn where they can obtain food, and they flock to it. Feed his sheep. They're his children, and he loves them very much. And when you take time for one of them, it makes his day. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to complete this by doing what I suppose all of you know I'm going to do and intended to from the beginning, is cover the 23rd Psalm, which follows what? Well, naturally, it follows the 22nd Psalm. Well, what is the 22nd Psalm? Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane, Christ's words on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our Father did not forsake him. But he, the Lord Jesus Christ, was quoting the 27th Psalm, which spoke of his very hands and feet being pierced, uh, for the wicked had enclosed me in verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. They nailed him to the cross. You see, that's the, if you want a death psalm, as many people consider the 23rd, use the 22nd. But the 23rd Psalm is the Resurrection Psalm, and it reads, Psalms 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let me ask you a question. Do you want? Do you want for something? Do you have peace of mind? Then you had better reanalyze yourself and decide whether or not the Lord truly is your shepherd. What does that mean? A shepherd feeds you, cares for you, strengthens you. Verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Boy, he feeds me good. The luscious, the best there is. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Do you know what still waters are? They are quiet, but they are deep. It's the shallow water that rushes and makes a big fuss. Have you ever seen rapids, how the water rushes, foams, and bubbles? But deep water or deep thought or deep truth is still, and it is peaceful. Verse 3. He restoreth um, my soul. That being translated means he gives me eternal life. He leadeth me. Did he say he drives me? No. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He wants you to be righteous for his name's sake. Though we fall short, we help in that feeding of the sheep. For, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Our shepherd is always with us. And what is this valley of death? Have you never read the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, where the entire valley of dry bones is out there? And, he, and God said, Ezekiel, preach to them. Give them my word. Prophesy to them. And bone came to bone. They weren't dead bones. They were people that were spiritually dead. And when God's word strikes them, bone comes to bone and light to life. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Your shepherd does not beat you with his rod. He will chastise you at times, but you always deserve it. Thank him and go on. Verse 5, Thou preparest a table. Now listen to me. Thou preparest a table. You know what a table is for? To eat from. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Man, I mean right on the battlefield, right when things couldn't be going uh, any worse maybe at times, he sups with you. He feeds you. He gives you what you need. 
Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. That anointing your head with that oil is the mental he places upon his elect, especially those that are teachers. And that mental gives the authority, and naturally your cup runneth over. Six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? He has given that one eternal life. Feed the sheep. God's word is so abundant. It's so good. It's the only way you'll ever find peace of mind in this world. That is to say, set your mind at rest where you can understand what's happening in the world today and where we're going. What will consummate the end of this age that will give you the strength and the protection? And never forget, even as you feed more so, the chief shepherd's staff is over you, protecting you. And if the destroyer comes too close, he will move him back from your presence. You see, he has even given you the authority. As it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, over all your enemies. So, you know what that makes you? It makes you a child of God. Act like it. And use the authority that he has empowered you with. To do what? Win wars? To feed his sheep. Feeding his sheep wins the war. Feeding his sheep wins the battle. Because there is only one trough that's a feeding place. There is only one trough that gathers all the fold into it, and it will all become one fold. And that is the trough and the place in which the true pasture of food is fed to the lambs, and its ingredients, its content, you can read the label on it, is called the living word of God. Pour it out abundantly before the sheep, before God's children, and you will always be blessed for it. For the chief shepherd will always be on watch for you. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment.